The title of this video is Ruby on Rails for Node Developers. First, I will give a high level overview of Ruby and Ruby on Rails. Then we will build a demo app using Ruby on Rails to get a feel for what it's like. And then finally, I will show you how to deploy this app that we are going to build to a Docker container. So what is Ruby? Ruby is a programming language that was created by a Japanese guy by the name of Yukihiro Matsumoto. I hope I am pronouncing his name correctly. A few years after this language came on the scene, it became quite popular and it got picked up by this Danish programmer by the name of David Heinemeyer Hansen. That's him right there. David Heinemeyer Hansen used Ruby to build his own web application framework that has since grown to become what we know as Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails is quite popular. It was used to build the early versions of Twitter, the early versions of GitHub, and the early versions of Airbnb, if I'm not mistaken. So it definitely has made its impact. Here are the tenants or the doctrine that has guided David Heinemeyer Hansen in the development of this web application framework. I'm not going to go over all of these, but I will highlight two or three of these that I like most. So Ruby on Rails is a web application framework that is optimized for programmer happiness. Ding. Definitely like that one. It is one that exalts beautiful code. Ding. Definitely like that one. And it is one that pushes up a big tent. This means that the culture surrounding Ruby on Rails is one that welcomes people who are interested in learning about it. Now let's jump into building this app. We will be building an API for a very simple mailing list. This API will expose CRUD routes for one model and the data for this model will be stored in a PostgreSQL table with two columns, one column for emails and another column for whether or not each email is subscribed to the mailing list. You should be able to get this up and running regardless of what your environment happens to be. But just for reference, my environment is Mac OS version 12.4, and I had to install Xcode 13.4.1 along with the 13.4.1 command line tools to get this working. As I understand it, Xcode not only installs an IDE for developing iPhone apps, but also installs certain necessary C and C++ libraries that are used by Ruby on Rails and Ruby to work. After you have all of the prerequisites taken care of, you should be able to type this command and check out your Ruby version. I am using Ruby version 3.1.2. For the node developers, you should be familiar with a tool called NVM that allows you to easily switch between what node version you are using in your environment. And NVM has a corresponding tool in the Ruby community called RVM, and it works with the almost identical API as NVM does. You can use RVM to easily switch between what Ruby version you are using. After you have that all set up, you can type this command to generate a fresh Ruby on Rails application. You do not have to type all of the Ruby on Rails code out from scratch. That is the benefit of using a framework. Let's take a look at the generated Ruby on Rails application. For the node developers, you should be familiar with the package.json file where you specify the third party libraries that are used by your node apps. The corresponding file in the Rails world is the gem file. This is where you specify the third party Ruby libraries or gems that your Rails applications will be using along with the versions of the gems that you want to use. In a high level manner, a Rails application can be described as a server-side rendered MVC framework. MVC meaning models, views, controllers. Models are where you specify the data that your application will be dealing with. Views are where you specify the user interfaces for your application. And controllers are where you specify the logic for the API endpoints that are exposed by your Rails app. There are many other files and folders in a generated Rails application, and they all do very specific things. This is part of the convention over configuration tenant in the Rails doctrine that I showed you at the beginning of this video. The value of convention over configuration is threefold. First, it prevents you from redeveloping features that have already been developed by somebody else in the Rails community. Second, by you reusing existing code, it means that the existing code gets more testing and more use meaning that the quality of each gem becomes higher. And finally, it allows developers to easily collaborate on other Rails projects. 
The API for this simple mailing list will feature persistent data. So for that, we will need a database and I will spin up a database via a Docker container running a PostgreSQL image. This is the command that you will need. I have already ran this command and you can see the database running in Docker here. All right. So now we can continue configuring the Rails app to plug into the database. We can add this configuration file to the config slash database.yaml file in order to finish plugging in the Rails app to the database we just spun up. That should do it. And now we should be able to run Rails setup and it will create the databases for using the Rails app in development mode and test mode. And now we can continue by generating our model, right? I was mentioning that the model is where you specify the data that your application will be dealing with. We want a member model that has two fields, an email field and a subscribed field, a true or false value saying whether or not this email is subscribed to our mailing list. Let's generate the model, right? Now you start to see some of the nice things about Rails, right? It does a lot of work for you if you know how to use it correctly. And after you specify your model, you now want to mirror this data type in the database. And you do that by running this command. Right, so now our database is set up to store the data that we have specified. Remember that I said the logic for your controllers is what gets triggered when an API endpoint is hit on your Rails server. When someone on the internet hits one of the API endpoints or routes on your Rails API or server, it will trigger the logic in your controllers. So first let's check which routes we have specified on this Rails API or server, right? We can type Rails routes to see what routes we have defined. This is Rails magic, right? We have no routes, but we can add routes in this file. So look what happens when we add this line of code to the routes.rb file. Save and we retype this Rails routes command. All of a sudden we have all of these routes, right? But now we need to define the controllers. We can scaffold out the controllers with this command. Rails will generate the controller files. Let me take a quick look, all right? Looks great. Now I have a snippet of all of the controller logic that I want to test. We can copy and paste this snippet. We can run server and we can test this route, which should return a JSON object with a key of foo that has a value of bar. Foo bar, foo bar, right? Foo bar. Fantastic. Let me quickly show you how to debug in Rails, right? So if I put a debug statement here, look what happens when I hit the endpoint, right? Sorry. Debugger, my bad. Debugger, right? We get a debugging console here. And we can click C to continue. And we get our value back, right? So that's how easy it is to use debugging. Let me show you the Rails console. So you can enter the Rails console like so. 
or you can just type C for short. And this will spin up a development environment for interacting with your application in various ways. It's mostly useful for getting data. For example, if I load this and then run this command, I can see all of the models that I have defined in my application, right? And I can query the class for all of the member data in the system. You can see that I've created one, two, three, right? I can create another one like so. And now I can find individual records like so. Right? So that's the gist of the console. You can use it for other things, but it's mostly useful for getting data from your database. Now let's continue. I will paste in some more snippets. For example, this is a catch-all error handler for the controller. The controller inherits from this class. So and copy, paste that into the application controller and then wrap up the controller logic for the members controller so that we have full CRUD capability on the members model. So now I can test this in Postman. I can create new members and I can query for data. I can delete data. All right? Five, four. So I should have only one record left, right? So all of the CRUD routes are defined. And now we will move on to this where we do some validation. So you can see that if I want to create a record, let's say that I create a record with an invalid email. See, it still goes through. That's not what we want. So we will add some validation to the model. That's the controller. We want the model. So if I paste in these validations inside of the model, then I try to add another record with an invalid email, we now get an error, right? That's what we want. So now I will wrap this up by adding some rate limiting and then quickly deploying this to a Docker container and then that will be it. We need this gem to be added to the project. This is like installing a new NPM package for the node folks. We find the gem file and we can add it anywhere. I will add it here and leave a little comment for rate limiting and then type bundle install. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it, Node folks? Then we add this file, initializers, rack attack, 
paste in this content. All right, so each IP address is limited to five hits on the API every 20 seconds. Let's call the get members endpoint. Twice, three times, four times, five times. Too many requests. Rate limited. Let's deploy this into a Docker container. So we have our database.yaml looking good. Okay, so. Here is where we need to add the Docker file. All right, just copying this jazz. And then Docker compose dot yaml. All with this content. This will all be included in the code. And finally, we need to create this file and make it executable. Should work. Docker compose up. Oops, we need to do one last thing, which is add the environment variable for Docker container that will house the Rails API. API works just as it did before, meaning we can deploy this to Kubernetes or Fargate, etc.